Hey everybody, Slider's Review here, and I'm here today to talk to you about a television show I discovered about, oh, four years ago or so. It came out in 2016, but sadly it ended in 2017, and it got cancelled after only two seasons, which sucks, because it's such a great show. It's a New Zealand show, a drama, a soap drama, and its name is Filthy Rich. Now I know what you're saying. I heard an American show by that name. Yeah, because they made an American remake of it. And until yesterday, I finally watched the American remake. And now I see why it got canceled after only one season. It completely sucked. But I'll get into that in another video. But I wanted to talk about Filthy Rich. And I'm only going to talk about season one of Filthy Rich. So this entire video will pertain to only season one. I will not go into detail about season two. The only thing about season two I would say is that in season one, it went from 20 episodes. In season two, it went to 13 episodes. But there are some revelations in season two that will contradict what I say in season one and make it seem false, but that's only because they threw in twist at season two. So yeah, when it comes to certain characters, um, yeah, what I say in season one, some things about them won't be factual. Let's just say that the New Zealand series, it was high pace, high octane um the, the music was great it was more edgy than what you would see in an american show they say like shit and fuck a lot um mostly shit and they say shit like a lot <laughs> and like you know and it's just like the, the people the cast of this show they look like supermodels like they're well toned they're chiseled if this was an American show, it should have been on the CW instead of Fox. On Fox, they went for kind of more realistic looking people, but on this show, they went for the supermodel approach. There's lots of clickety clacking going around. I mean, a lot of that going around. I mean, a lot of that going around in this series. Pretty much every main character and recurring character gets themselves some. They're... In this show, they have people who are constantly either half naked in their underwear. There are some that are fully naked. When it comes to fully naked people, the only thing, only thing you will see is TNA. That's like it. But yeah, there's lots of edgy sexual scenes and just, yeah, they really go out there in other countries and they're very tamed in America. One thing that shocked me about this series, well, there's two things. There's the insexual nature. Yeah, there's kind of like incest around some of the characters. It's like hinted to and stuff, and it's, and it's kind of like elaborate on a little bit more. Um, also, some of that incest stuff, like I said before, what happens in season two, then be like, oh, okay, great. It's not incest, but yeah, it's just, yeah. So that's gross. What really shocked me was the racism. I was very shocked about the racism in this. Because when it comes to New Zealand, I don't know anything about them. I know tons of American shows and movies film over there. I recognize a lot of the cast from other shows. I've even spoken to some of the cast online um, in the past. And it's just like, you know, I just never knew they had a racism problem over there. I know every country does, but you just never think about it when you don't see it. And this is the first, well, this is actually the second New Zealand show I've ever seen. I watched one episode of The Tribe. Uh, only one episode, one episode only. So, you know, that was like a teen drama show. And I didn't really understand what was going on, but yeah. But this is actually the second New Zealand show I've ever watched. I've actually watched three. Um, but yeah, and I was just so shocked to see like the racism in this. And then because like, and it, it was mainly from the white characters, but it's even from some of the other characters. Now the other characters, okay, New Zealand is a very mixed race. It's really hard. I don't know what a lot of their races are. Some of them are Pacific Islander. Other ones start with like this M word I can't pronounce. And then there's a whole bunch of other races that's in the mix. But when I was very shocked to hear the, the n-word because i've never seen a black person in new zealand or so i thought their black people look different from like other black people in other countries and stuff 
especially their hair texture. So I was like totally confused when I started hearing the N word. I'm just like, but there's no black people here. Why are they using that word? And then it turns out some of the, like I said, some of the black people are mixed with like other races over there. It's similar to like the Aborigine people in Australia. They're mixed in with other stuff. Well, the black people are mixed in with Aborigine over there in Australia. So, you know, they look different and stuff. And, um, but yeah, I guess, you know, when you're colonized by like England, it's bound to be some racism and stuff. But I was totally shocked to hear racism. And what was even more shocking, okay, there's one phrase that I won't use. I've used it before, and so have you, because it's the name of a song, <laughs> an older song. It has to do with the word jungle in it. <laughs> I had no idea that was like a racial term over there. I didn't say the whole term, but yeah. I discovered New Zealand is a very racist place. Shocking. And because like, okay, you know the director of Thor Ragnarok, Tiger YTT? He's from there. And he said that when he worked as a, um, when he worked in like a store, he had to work in the back. He wasn't allowed to work as a cash register type person because of his darker skin. Now, the red, what is it, Beast Morpher Power Ranger, I think his name is like R R Rony or Ronnie, something like that. He was on the Power Rangers Playback YouTube channel, and he was talking about his time as Power Rangers this and that. And he mentioned Austin St. John, who was the first red Power Ranger in um, the Power Ranger series, because they did that really wacky, lame crossover one of the lamest Power Rangers crossovers I've ever seen. But anyway, Austin was over there. And Austin hasn't been back in about like 20 years. You know what I'm saying? So it, it was really like exciting for fans. And Ronnie told like the story of how they were all in the club just dancing, having a good time. And Ronnie, he was in his zone. So he wasn't paying attention to what the other people were doing. And Austin noticed that there was a man staring down Ronnie hard, like staring him down, like he had a problem staring him down. And Ronnie didn't understand why, because you know, he just didn't even know it, and he just didn't understand why anybody would like do that to him. So Austin, being you know the big man that he is, he walks over to that man and he tells him, and he pretty much tells that man straight up, look, man. I don't know what your problem is. I don't know why you're staring down my friend, but there ain't gonna be no like mess, you know what I'm saying? And if there is some mess, I'm gonna handle you type thing, you know? And so that was like really cool him doing like the big brother thing. And then it's because their race is over there. And the red Power Ranger dude, the Beast Morpher dude, he's black, you know? Then after doing some more research, because I just typed in New Zealand racist, and then I typed in New Zealand hates black people or something like that, and some articles came up. One article was from a black American doctor. She went over there and, she, and then there was another one from a Native American man and he went over there. Both of them have literally said they have experienced more racism in one week of staying over there in New Zealand than they have in their entire adult life in America. Whoa. <laughs> That's pretty heavy. Especially for like... Uh, it's, it's just insane. So it was insane when I started hearing the racism in this show, you know When it does come to some of the racism on the show Like half the time I didn't even know like some of these phrases were like Racist because you know they speak like Kiwi and stuff because you know they're from New Zealand But like there are characters such as like Kennedy and Nancy That will literally call the characters out to them out. That's racist and everything. I'm just like, oh So that phrase is racist now, what is this show about? It's all about money, corporism, betrayal, sex, um, being like just, just like you know your typical rich, snooty like drama series. You know, it's just like people hating one another. One's trying to like climb the corporate ladder. You know, people constantly betraying each other. People constantly lying to each other. People setting people up. Um, there's murder, there's intrigue, it's very high paced. Despite the racism and the nasty incest stuff, I really love this series. Like, it was a great series, and I wish it never got canceled. And I'm very embarrassed by the 
American version. The American version is basically like a parody of like just everything. <laughs> like it reminds me of Good Country Bellas. That was an okay show, but it didn't get picked up for a second season. But it's more hokey than that show is. Like it's just it's 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 just like the, the American version is a, a a country bumpkin religious Christian show with like really bad acting. Like it's terrible. It's terrible. But anyways, into this show. So at first I was gonna do just a character bi um bio of like rundown of like all the characters, right? But then I started to notice, well, some of the characters' story arcs are interwoven into other characters' story arcs. So it's going to be kind of hard bopping back and forth. So I would kind of just like, I'm going to try my best to give like a character profile and then go by plot by plot, something like that. So it's going to be slightly choppy, but not really, you know. There are a lot of characters in this show. And I mean, there are a lot. There are main characters, there are recurring, there are guests. And they all get their own individual like story arcs and they have like a lot to do. So that's really great about this show that I really appreciate. Um, I mean, they really took the time to give everybody something like meaningful to do. You know what I'm saying? So that's really great. It's a shame because, you know, like I complain about Ace a lot and Nancy Drew because Ace doesn't really do much. And it's just like, and that's a smaller cast. So like American television can really like, you know, pay attention to what's going on in other countries because, you know, it's just, there's some things that they can actually do better, like the edginess, for example. Now, what actually got me watching this show was actually when I started doing like the streaming stuff, I was like researching one of the stars of this show and I saw that she was on a show called Filthy Rich. I'm like, well, that sounds pretty interesting. And so I found it on Hulu. Now, Hulu used to have this for six years on their, uh, on their streaming site, but they finally took it down halfway into this month, which really sucked. Thankfully, I watched this years ago and I rewatched it again, and I was able to remember a lot of stuff that happens, especially in season two, where things get a little bit more crazier. This show actually stars a lot of people I love to watch in a lot of American New Zealand shows. Them, a lot of them have come from Power Rangers, Xena, Hercules, Young Hercules, Cleopatra 2525, Jack of All Trades, you know, um, some uh, movies like Underworld, the Underworld movies, um, the Narnia movies. It's just like, wow, I was very shocked to see like a lot of people that I actually like. And there's a lot of stars here I really respect a lot. Like, the main actress is like one of my all-time favorite actresses of all time. Um... And what's interesting is that after, because a lot of them starred in like Power Rangers and stuff like that before they did this show. And then when some of them actually did this show, then later on they starred in like Power Rangers shows. So that's really cool. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, but Mirama Smith. Uh, let's see, Mirama Smith. Yeah, she plays the main character and I've seen her in a lot of stuff. I first saw her in Young Hercules, Xena. I saw her in Legend of the Seeker. Um, oh, and then of course she was one of the villain, the villain hench women from Power Rangers Dino Thunder. And she always plays like strong, fierce type characters. She never plays like a weak character. So that's really cool. Elizabeth Haw Hawthorne. Man, I have seen her all the way back in the Hercules days. I first heard her, oh, I saw her first in Hercules. I saw her in the Chronicles of Narnia, the first movie. I saw her in Underworld Rise of the Lycans. I heard her voice in Cleopatra 2525. She was in Legend of the Seeker. She was in Power Rangers. She, uh, she's an actress I like a lot. Teresa Healy, she's an actress I like. I haven't saw her in much, but she was in Xena. She played um, Celestra, who's kind of like the angel of death type person. And she was really good. Now, I was surprised, man. Her character in this show is racist. Like, oh my God. Another actress that I really like, and I've, I've watched her since the 90s, was Jodie Rimmer. Man, I remember her from, like, first I saw her in Xena. Then I saw her in Young Hercules, where she played Lilith. Then in the adult Hercules show, she played the daughter of Lilith. 
And I mean, you know, I, and she, uh, she's also been in Power Rangers. I just always like her spunky, like, personality and her look. And she's the, she, this is the first time I ever saw her do some, like, heavy drama type stuff. And it's just like, wow, man, I couldn't believe. No wonder if she gets the awards that she does. And yes, that is Ryan Gosling and Young Hercules. So the show is about this man named John Truebridge. He is the person, he's a multi-billionaire and he owns like the company that's named after him. And he's this very like ruthless, salacious type, corrupt type business man. You know how they all are on TV shows and stuff. One interesting thing about this, we only see him in the present day in the first couple of minutes of the episode after that is just flashbacks and ironically he never says not one word in the entire series not a single one now in the american one it's completely different there he talks and there's a twist when it comes to him um i'll get into i mean, actually I'm, I'm not even going to mention the american one no more until i actually make that video and so with john john senior he had he, he he owns the company and his wife that he's married to named brady she um co-owns the company she's like this uh she's kind of like the ceo and stuff like that but he's the chairman and you know you know that kind of thing now originally okay so this is what happened so we see him and we see him having a business deal with a another businessman and the grease that will he offers him a briefcase full of money right after that um the meeting's over with and then it cuts to the businessman with the briefcase going to his limo and all of a sudden we see john fall from the sky and crashes down into the limo and he is deader than dirt now it was always led to believe that he only had one son john jr i'll get into him a little bit later but then after he died the will comes out and it's discovered he has three other kids three other kids that he cheated on his wife with now he didn't cheat on her with brady he cheated on her with john jr's mom i think john jr's mom is named sylvia i think anyway so he cheats on her he cheats on her with um, all these three other women. And so the thing about Sylvia is that she is extremely racist. She does not like people of brown skin whatsoever. And she lets it be known in every single episode she is in. And of course, because she's racist, she has taught John Jr. to be racist. Anyway, with her, she was originally married to him many, many years ago. And she used to co-own the company until they divorced. And then he kicked her out. But she still holds on to certain assets of the company, like True Bridge, um, but True Bridge, that's hard to say, True Bridge um, Housing Company that she runs with John Jr. Anyways, when yeah, when he was married to her, he cheated on her with all these three women. And so she's been bitter ever since, and she's been wanting to get back into the company business. Um and she will do anything possible to get into back in that business no matter who she has to sleep with who she has to corrupt who she has to trick you know that type of thing and one of the people that she sleeps with is a man by the name of sir duncan he is a shareholder of the company now john jr john jr is your typical like rich boy on a tv show he's corrupt in every way you're supposed to hate this character he's mean he's evil he manip he manipulates people he sleeps around he does drugs he drinks alcohol he doesn't care how he hurts people he constantly just uses people left and right and like i said before he's racist but he's mildly racist and stuff but yeah um, he sleeps around. It doesn't matter if you're male, female, he will hit that. You know, it's just like anything that's standing, walking past him, he wants to like clickety clack it, you know. He has this bachelor pad type place where it has the word bang <laughs> on it and stuff. He is also incest, which is really gross. But I will say this for the actor. This dude gives it his all in this series. And it's like he's having a lot of fun. Like everybody in this show is great at acting. 
this man takes it up by like a million and i mean a million it doesn't matter if he has to do like nudity doesn't matter if he has to like um do stuff with men or women it doesn't matter if he has to touch himself it doesn't matter this man gives it his all performance in this show but i dislike this character a lot because like i said before you're meant to hate him from the beginning now brady she is a tough character she is ruthless she is caring to her family that's like the only time she ever has like a real like heart but she also likes her assistant but you know and some of the people that work with her that are loyal to her but she is ruthless she is mean she basically will make you piss your pants like she is the boss of bosses and stuff she also cheats on her husband she cheats on him before he died she cheats on him after he dies like you know this is a and then and she doesn't just cheat with him but she only cheats with people that she actually like and wants to start like a relationship with but she sleeps with them first for a really long time before she starts that relationship she is the ceo of the company she will not give it up for no reason she will fight tooth and nails and she will plant evidence on people just to get like the business deal rolling like like unlike her husband he will use money she she will use her assistant to like do things <laughs> with other clients and stuff to seal the deal and it doesn't matter what happens to her client like she'll feel bad about it but as long as she gets the deal still that's all she cares about and even when it comes to her own daughter like something really bad creepy happens to her and before she had that man arrested she made sure she sealed the deal by blackmailing him now for the three offspring they are some intriguing characters savannah is probably my most favorite out of like everybody in this show because the show centers around her she has so much layers of like character development and plot driven stuff and it's just like she's a very very fascinating character she is a stripper she had a tough upbringing her mom is a druggy alcoholic her she's had a lot of bad stuff that's happened to her in the past like it gets revealed to her later on in the series that well she knew already that her first stepdad messed around with her when she was like 10 and 12 years old what she didn't know was that her mom knew about it and didn't do anything about it this caused a ripple effect between the two of them because before then she's always cared about her mom and taking care of her mom because she knows her mom has a drug problem and but deep down inside she hates her mom and there's so much back and forth between those two that it makes her character so much more interesting. Then when she finds out that she's rich and we find out some more stuff about her, then it's like, oh my God, I can't believe it, you know? But she's one of those type of people that even though she's a stripper, she doesn't act salacious in real life. Like she wants to get out of poverty. She wants to better herself. She wants to take over the family business and stuff and she wants to make something of herself so that's why she's one of my favorite characters even though there are a lot of bad characters and no good characters the interesting thing about this show is that there are no good characters there are some people who do good things but then they turn around and do bad stuff and so it's really hard to find out which character is an actual nice character because there really isn't one even the nicest person on this show has done some shady stuff on this show the only person who's probably good and never done anything wrong is probably Grace's dad. And he's only there to bang um, Brady. Then there's Garth. The real Garth. He is a, you know, a poor, a poor kid. He lives with his mom and he also stays with his best friend. Or well, his best friend stays with him. See, his best friend, Zach, he... His parents died when he was young. They kind of like took him in. They, and they, they just been, they, they're a really close unit. You know what I'm saying? Garth even tells him that, you know what, man, since you've always been there for me and my mom, when I get this money, you know, I'm going to share half of it with you because you're my best friend and all the other stuff. Now, we don't know much about Garth because this happens as they're driving to get to the um, location to get like the will and the company and stuff like that. 
Zach decides he's going to goof around and try to put weed in Garth's mouth. This causes a car accident. They go off the road and he's in a coma for the rest of the series. So what happens to him and his money? Well, Zach decides to go there and he's going to tell these people straight up, like, look, this is what happened to Garth. He's in a car accident. He's in a coma. But they mistaken Zach for Garth. And something clicks in his head. He's just like, hmm, lots of money here. So he pretends to be Garth throughout the entire series. Like, no joke. <laughs> but for the most part, he is the nicest character, one, one of the nicest characters in this show. But because he fooled everybody, you know, it made some shady, you know what I'm saying? But yeah, he's a really, like, nice around guy. He's huge, but he ends up getting his butt kicked a lot by like two different men in this series. Now let's put a pen in him later. Then there's Joe. Joe disappoints me out of like everybody in this series. Like you're meant to hate John Jr. But when it comes to Joe, it's like, dude, you could have been the best out of all of them because of how he was brought up and stuff and his beliefs. And then he throws all that away for like sex and money and and it's just like dude you do he does a lot of bad disappointing stuff in this series and i'm just like man not in his american series you know i said i want to talk about the american series in his american series what bugs me about that is that you know john i don't know exactly what his race race is not john but joe i don't know exactly what his race race is but he's clearly a man of color Sadly, when it comes to Joe, out of all of the, the kids out of wedlock, he was the one who was abandoned. It is revealed that he was thrown in the trash bin. And so when he finds that out, he didn't know he was adopted. So when he finds that out, he's upset, he's pissed, and that will cause him to spiral out of control. And I understand that. But then some of the other stuff he does is like, man, what are you doing? What are you doing? And so, one of the people, like, he doesn't really hang out that much with the whole family. His whole thing is hanging out with John Jr. And then he does a lot of shady stuff to Brady towards the end of the series. But with Joe, he is, you know, he's a, a boxing coach. He teaches all these young kids how to stay out of trouble and teach them how to box and all this other stuff. And he had an extremely good upbringing, like a very good one. He's even dating a very beautiful woman named Ariana, and they're engaged. And she's this sweet as sugar can be type person. And it's just like, she's super religious, and she will not have sex until she's married. So her and Joe, you know, and he's okay with that. He accepts that, you know what I'm saying? And it's just like, she helps out young kids as well. And... So it's kind of like if she's sweet as sugar, why is she still like not the best character, like like a good character? Well, it's not so much that she does. Okay, well she does do something wrong. Something happens between her and Joe, and it causes her to turn like crazy a little bit. And then um, when they break up, she gets with John Jr., which that just makes her dumb <laughs> in my opinion, because everybody knows what John Jr. is like. One thing I find very interesting about Ariana is that, like, she, you know, her and Joe are arguing, and he's trying to tell her to stay away from, like, John Jr., she's all, like, she can change him, like, you know, she can make him see the light because she's super religious, and I get a lot of religious people are like that, but it's just weird to think that he's going to change his ways after all these years, his mild racism, like, um, his partying ways, his drug abuse, alcohol type stuff, and it's just like, you know, and he does trick her. Like, he tricks her into, like, dumping out all his alcohol and his drugs, but he still has, like, drugs snatched around his house. But it's just, like, what really makes her think that he's going to change? It almost makes her seem just, like, so stupid, almost, because it's kind of like she was smarter when she was with Joe. But then it's just, like, I don't know. It's just, like, she, they just, like, dumbed down her character the moment she got with John Jr. Because she just feels that he's such a great man and like you know and he can like see the light and stuff 
Now there is Nancy. She is the sister of John Sr. And she lives in the mansion with Brady and her daughter. And Nancy is a very eccentric woman. She loves to walk around naked. She loves to swim naked. She loves to do her yoga naked. She she's just uh, uh, she's out there, you know what I'm saying? It's also revealed she was once in a mental ward. And it's also and it's because of that she takes prescribed medication. Now there isn't too much about her in the first series, or even much in the second one, but she's there because she's there to give details she knows everything about the family secrets and stuff and she even has secrets of her own and her big secret revelation comes at the end of season two which i was like oh my god <laughs> but she knows more than she lets on especially when it comes to joe being abandoned which she kind of doesn't fully tell him the truth see what it is is that see joe's whole thing is he's looking for his mom and she tells him why he was abandoned after you know john senior and his mom did it and stuff he did not want her to keep the baby uh, it would have been too scandalous you know what i'm saying especially because of like the race thing because joe is a man of color so um it was revealed so when so when Joe and John Jr. are doing some like investigation, they find out that there was a white woman who actually threw the baby in the bin. It wasn't his actual mother. Now, Joe's mother is presumably dead. And let's put a pin in that later. And so, so it's kind of like, who was the white lady who threw him in the bin? Well, Nancy tells him that it was her for some bizarre reason. Why? Like, I don't know. I guess it's because she didn't want him to find out the truth of the real woman who threw him in the bin and and get involved with those people. And who is that? John Jr.'s mother. She is the one who threw him in the bin. Now, let's put a pin in that for later. Now, one thing that's gross about Nancy is that she has a huge crush on Zach, who's pretending to be Gar. She doesn't know that he's pretending to be somebody else. She literally thinks that's her nephew. And she is constantly walking around him naked, flirting with him. Ew. Like, she thinks that's her nephew. Like, why is she doing... Is this like a rich people thing? Or is this just like a thing in another country? Because, like, why is there so much, like, incest nature in this show? And then there's Kennedy. She is the daughter of... Brady and Brady only. John is not her father, just stepfather. She is your typical teenager. She cares about taking selfies. She has the best friend. She starts to have a thing for older men. Like she clearly has a thing for older men. And she starts hitting on Zach, which is pretending to be Garth. So <clears throat> she's like constantly hitting on like everybody hits on this dude. Like she is constantly like hitting on him she's in her underwear she's trying to make out with him all kind of stuff he's pushing her away he's like look even though we're not related you're underage because she's only a teenage girl and that's not trying to stop her but then at one point she does end up making out with him but then something breaks it up either he breaks it up or nancy breaks it up and nancy breaks it up for a specific reason so when it comes to kennedy like then she starts thinking okay well whatever her and her best friend grace they're gonna go to the nightclubs and the bars and pretend to be older women and start like getting the attention of like the men there and they do to the point where she a uh, grace not grace but kennedy gets in like some trouble with this one creepy guy and she gets saved by another man so the kennedy character she hates savannah with passion she sees the way that Zach looks at her and it makes her jealous. Um, and she doesn't like how she spends so much time with her mom, Brady, to where she literally thinks that, you know, her mom likes Savannah more than she likes her. But her and Savannah never like have it out, which I wish they would. Alan, he is the minister of parliament and he saves her, but then he starts grooming her. And if you don't know what that means, that's when an older person grooms a teenager and lower their expectations and then starts dating them after a while. 
So he's grooming her. And the thing about him is that we know he is a creepy man because of this other character, Cherry. Cherry is Brady's assistant. She is this super sweet woman who is also very shy, very timid, and very paranoid. She has no self-confidence. She doesn't understand why she can't get a man. And when she does get a man, she becomes super paranoid. She's the type of person that way if she suspects her boss, either Brady or somebody else, is up to something or she overhears a conversation, she will literally take that um, her boss's cell phone and start going through their stuff to like find out what they did. And she always gets caught. Now, like I said before, Brady has her do some salacious stuff with other men to close the deal. She had Cherry one time, like, date this one client man to where she needed to prove that he was using company funds um, on the women he dates and stuff. And so, there are pictures of him and her in bed. Uh, but then Brady's like, I need more. I need to show that he's spending money on you. So they have receipts, a hotel receipt and a restaurant receipt. Well, the hotel thing he paid with cash. And you know how them businessmen do when they pay with cash. But he made a mistake when he used the company car to buy her lunch and dinner and stuff. So because of that, she was able to seal the deal that way. Now, Brady also has her seal the deal with the Minister of Parliament, the Allen man. When she goes over there to deliver some papers, that's all she's there for. She's there just to deliver papers. Now, when she seals the deal, she never sleeps with none of these men. At least I don't think she does. But she wasn't naked in the bed with that one man. So anyway, with her, she's over there delivering papers. He invites her in. They have drinks. And he tells her, get naked. And she does because she's scared. And he just looks at her. He looks at her. He walks around her. But he never touches her, that's the thing. Then he just tells her, okay, you're free to leave. And she's completely creeped out. She she feels violated and all this other stuff. And she, I think she tells Brady, and Brady's like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know he was like that. She's lying. <laughs> and so, he's creepy. Now, she ends up dating Zach in this series. Because she's crushing on him and stuff but then she starts to see he's into other women to make sure and then she starts like dating him dating him and she's very paranoid now one thing i didn't mention just yet because i haven't went into full detail of the series is that zach has a crush on savannah because they're not related um you know he he wants her bad because the thing about zach is that first kennedy wanted him then his own aunt Nancy wanted him too. Nancy was constantly flirting with him, but they're not related. So that's a good thing. That's the whole incest thing I'm talking about. So, yeah. So, so then he found like, okay, well, Cherry's cute and everything. So he starts dating her until she becomes paranoid because she thinks Savannah wants him. Because then later on, Savannah finds out his secret. And, but here's the thing. Cherry finds out his secret first because when they was out having lunch, a dinner date, what happened was he met somebody he went to high school with. He tried to play it off like his name's not Zach, it's Garth. And, the, and then he tells you know, Cherry to leave. She's just kind of suspicious. She's kind of like she starts bugging him for the truth and he's lying to her. But then something happens. Garth, real mother, shows up and she wants to hang out with Zach because she wants to know where all this money came from because he gave her remember how I said he's pretending to be Garth and so he's have access to all his money when the real Garth needs to go to a hospital in Australia and the mom can't pay for it he takes all of Garth's money out the bank and he gives it to Garth's mother which is really sweet like at least he's not that terrible you know what I'm saying spending it on other stuff like he's really not a bad character at all it just he lied <laughs> and stuff so yeah but Garth but then Garth's mother she wanted to come down and visit she wants to know where all this money came from and she wants to see him because he hasn't been because she hasn't saw him since this whole ordeal happened and because she doesn't know what happened she doesn't know that John has died and stuff and so 
Cherry is being like nosy, trying to know who this woman is, and he tells her, "Look, she's just a, a friend of the uh, a friend of my friend. Oh, she's the mother of my friend, and we're just gonna hang out. Nothing's gonna happen. Um, this is private. You know, we're just gonna catch up." And he tells Cherry like just to back off and don't come and visit because he's staying at Cherry's house when Garth's mom is coming to visit. Cause he can't. Because he's staying at Brady's place and she can't go there. What does Cherry do? Show up. Start talking. And finds out, oh, he lied about who he is. And she tells him, oh, I'll keep your secret. But um, this is where the bad stuff about her comes in. So like I said, she's paranoid. She doesn't like Savannah. And she tells Savannah, look, um, Zach is my man. Back off. <laughs> and she basically blackmails Zach into staying with her. When things don't go right and she starts to be more paranoid and she starts to see that him and Savannah are hanging out more, she decides to contact the real guard's mother. And she tells her straight up, I got some stuff to tell you and it's about Zach. He hasn't been honest with you. And then that scene cuts off and then it goes to the second season because it was towards the end of the series. Okay, so back to the series. So, after John Sr. dies, the will comes out and those three kids find out that they're related to him. They're shocked, they're confused, and they wanna know what's going on. Now, Brady, she doesn't want none of them kids to try to take over the family company business because that's what's part of the will. They are supposed to take over the family business. She does not want that to happen. She instead wants to buy them out of their shares. And she offered them a couple of thousand dollars to do so. Which is not much money at all. So when it comes to like Savannah, she's all like, uh-uh. She wants the company business. She wants to be part of it. You know, because she wants money. The, um, the other two guys, well, Joe doesn't want money, supposedly. And then, you know, Zach, he does. So, but here's the thing about Brady. She knows, she knew about one of the um, children. She knew about Savannah because Savannah's mom, who's the alcoholic druggie, she confronted Brady about it and she tried to shake her up for some money. But Brady wasn't having it and sent her on her way and stuff. And she knew that Savannah's mom had like alcohol and drug problem, but she didn't care. And so Brady is trying to do everything in her power to get rid of these three kids. She doesn't want nothing to do with them. But of course she has to suck her up to them to gain their trust, buy them out, and then send them on their merry way. Now, Brady and John Jr., they hate each other. After John Sr. cheated on her with all them women, um, John Jr.'s mother, like, he didn't stay with none of those women, but he stayed with Brady and he dumped her for Brady. And she owns more of the company. So, of course, John Jr. and his mom, they're trying to get the company back. Now, they know about all those kids, and but they don't know necessarily what they all look like, except for Savannah. They know who Savannah is. They um, John Jr. tracks her down. He knew that he was related to her. So he tracks her down in the strip club, pretends that he doesn't know her, and he pretty much buys her, like prostitution style. But he doesn't do anything when he goes to the hotel where they're just eating and stuff. Being Savannah and wanting to, she doesn't know who John Jr. is. She's never seen him. And he doesn't even tell her his name. And so, but she knows that he paid a lot of money to get her for one night. So, being her, she decides that, hey, this man got money. If I can get in good with him, then I can get out of the stripping business and, you know, and stuff like that. So she starts to flirt with him. He's backing off because he knows who she is. But then he lets her do him anyway. So they they clickety clacking it all night long. It's like, dude, this is your sister, your half sister. What are you doing? Like that's just so gross and nasty. But we see also how gross and nasty he is when it comes to his mom. They have a weird love hate and sexual relationship as well. See, John Jr., since he's such a goofball, his mom doesn't think he's man enough to handle the company. So she feels she has to do everything herself when it comes to him. And so that pisses him off. So, you know, that's why that love-hate thing comes from. 
but the way they talk to each other is weird. She's always around her lingerie around him. Their heads are way too close. And then they kiss on the lips. I'm just like, ugh. I don't like it when parents kiss their kids ever. But the way these two kiss was too sensual and sexual. And it's just like, what is up with this show and incest, man? <laughs> so John Jr., his whole motivation is that he wants these three siblings of his to try to take the company from Brady. Then he's going to take it from them. So he has to get in good with them. So one way he gets in good is that he is sleeping with his yoga instructor. But the yoga instructor also sleeps with brady and she really likes him a lot and she has no idea that he's is messing around with john jr so john jr has like you know inside mold into what's going on in that house and stuff now when it comes to john senior death it looks like a suicide and that's what everybody believes however nobody ever stops to think was he ever murdered but brady starts to think that maybe he might be murdered because when she gathers all of John's stuff from his office she found some interesting stuff she found a portrait of him and her being married she also found this strange doll and the doll is burnt on his right side and there's a note that says remember me so she's starting to wonder hey he might be murdered but okay but then she doesn't really pursue it until the end of the series. And it's just kind of like she completely forgot about it because there's so much stuff going on in her now, life. Now, one thing about this series I also don't like is like how things just randomly happen because of convenience. Because the story needs it to happen. A lot of plot armor, if you will. It's just a random thing. People figuring stuff out really quick. People spying on folks with no explanation. Um, you know, just random stuff like that. That just kind of brings down the series. But Brady has one thing on her um, agenda, and that is to find out who's blackmailing her. Because she gets like this envelope, and inside it are pictures of her sleeping around with her yoga instructor. And she's been doing that since John Sr. was alive. And so it's like she does, and then it's in her own house. So it's kind of like who is blackmailing her? But the person's not even blackmailing her because they're not asking for money. So, the thing about Brady is, she has a friend who's a PI, and so every time Brady gets in some trouble, her PI friend hops into it and saves her butt. So now she needs to know who's blackmailing her, um, essentially, well, without the money. So anyway, the PI person, she's doing her stuff, and she discovers where the camera is like, well, first, she sees that since the pictures are coming from inside the place and um, she's doing it with the yoga instructor. She assumes it's the yoga instructor. But then she finds the camera and she finds out where the camera is located. So she knows it has to be somebody who's been in and out her house a lot. So she's assuming that it's the yoga instructor. So she has the PI follow the yoga instructor. And that's where she finds out that he's been sleeping with John Jr. So Brady confronts him about it. But he's all like, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't know where these pictures come from. So she breaks it off with him because she's really pissed and upset. So she knows it's not the yoga instructor. And so it's not one of the three kids because she just met them. And this is and she's been being blackmailed since before they came into uh, fruition. It's not her own biological daughter. And she knows it's not going to be Nancy because Nancy is very loyal to her. So it can only be one person and one person only. The maid. And she suspects it's the maid because when, so when she suspects that it's the maid, she goes in her room and starts looking for stuff. And she finds a picture in the Bible of the maid and John Jr. looking very cozy, but nothing romantic. So she confronts the maid about this. And she tells her what's up with this picture, what's up with the blackmail, what's up with this little doll thing. And the maid, pretty much, the maid is like a Russian lady who lives there with them. And she tells her playing much. She hates her guts. She says that John Sr. is a good man. He provided for his family. The ones, not the ones that he abandoned, of course. But, you know, that he's a good man. And she had no business sleeping around 
cheating on him with all these younger men because John Sr. is an older man. And she tells her that, you know, that God will judge you because she's very religious. So she said, God will judge you, this, this, and that, and blah, 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 blah. So that's where the whole doll thing came into play. Or so she thinks. The doll did not come from the maid, only the salacious pictures and stuff. And so, of course, she fires the maid and everything like that. But then before the maid leaves, she tells her straight up, you know, there's a lot that was going on with your husband that he confined in me that he would never tell you. And, you know, and there's a bigger picture to all this. So, you know, they have like a family meeting with the, the new relatives and stuff. And when they come all in, John Jr. is not there at first. And so, you know, the kids, she's telling them, you know, like this John Cena was your father and this is how much money you're entitled to. And, um, you know, why would you want to take over this? Like, why would you want to work for this company? You don't know nothing about it. You don't know how to do no business. Let me just buy you all out, blah, blah, blah. So they, and, she, and Savannah's all like, let us think about this because Savannah does not want to back away from all this money and stuff. And so John, no, not John, but um, Joe, he tells her, look, man, I don't care about money. I just want to know who my mom is, my, my father. And she's all like, well, I'm sorry. I don't have no information for you. So he bolts and he leaves. And like I said before, he doesn't really hang out with the family all that much. And as he's leaving, he meets John Jr. coming in. And of course, John Jr. is being racist to him. So he knows straight up John Jr. is racist. And then so they leave. And then this is what I'm talking about the random stuff is that Carl, he is Savannah's second stepfather and who owns the strip club. And he just sneaks into the gate and he's on their property, but he doesn't do anything. And we don't see him do anything. And it's never brought up. That's just kind of weird. So John Jr. crashes the home and then he sees Savannah and he pretends like he doesn't know her. She is flabbergasted and disgusted and she just takes off running. So Brady and Nancy know that John Jr. has done something, but they don't know what. Now Nancy, she hates John Jr.'s guts to death, but Brady hates him as well. So Brady runs out to Savannah asking her, you know, what happened and everything. And she tells him that she didn't know who he was and they slept together. He knew who she was and yeah, ugh. Whew, I'm telling you, man. <laughs> so, people, the Hanan, the new kids are trying to adjust to a new lifestyle. Savannah is still staying with her mom. And Garth, or Zach, he's just living it up. He's happy. He, he, he's in like this big mansion and he's just loving it, you know? But his, his interaction with Kennedy, because she wants to drive around with him and she keeps trying to mess with him and stuff, causes some problems because. Kennedy is driving in the car and he's with her, but then they get pulled over by a cop. The cop wants to see the, the driver's license of Zach. He's scared. He has Garth's driver's license and he gives it to him. Because both of them had a beard on at that time and they looked similar, the cop just thought, you know, that was Garth. So he's just kind of like a little worried now. So he decides he's going to shave and now he's fully clean shaven. He looks totally different now that he's shaved and stuff. Savannah goes back home and she's there with her mom and Carl and, they, and she tells them what's going on. And they come out, this is a great way for us to get some money. So Carl starts scheming big time. Now Carl owns strip club and he's Savannah's second stepfather. He's also the one who helped um, get well, she assumes that he's the one who murdered her first stepfather, but no, it was Savannah's mother. He just got rid of the body. Now, Carl is a thug and he hangs out a lot with this one gangster man. Let's put a pin in that for a little bit later. Joe confronts his parents and he's all like, how come y'all lied to me and all this other stuff and blah, blah, blah. And they tell me, you know, uh, they didn't mean to, but you know, it just like they thought it would be better for him, you know, stuff like that. Joe, so this is the thing, John Jr. 
wants to get on Joe's good side. So he starts hanging out with him. Joe doesn't want nothing to do with him, but he decides, hey, and John's all like, look, man, I can help you find out what happened to your mom and all this other stuff because he doesn't know that his mom is supposedly dead. He doesn't even know where he's at, where she's at. And so he's like, okay, whatever. And I'll just use this dude, whatever. But then he starts bonding with John Jr. to where they become like pretty good buds after a while. To the point where John Jr. corrupts Joe big time. They start wearing masks, they're vandalizing stuff, they're doing some heavy drinking, all that stuff. And next thing you know, while they're out, because they had just got through wearing like hockey masks and they had did something like stupid crazy, like frat boy crazy stupid, you know? And as they're like in the street, they see this woman being like assaulted by a man. Joe runs in, beats the man up, and then he rescues the woman. She wants to, um, and then John Jr.'s all like, hey, you know, you're a hot girl. Why don't you just hang out with us and party? So they start hanging out and they're partying and stuff, right? Then it cuts from that to Joe waking up next to the woman he rescued. Her name is Tony. And he's like, crap, dude, I just cheated on my fiance. But then you think he was stopped, but then he kept going back. To that Tony woman because like I said before he's getting corrupt and he's finally starting to get himself some now because Ariana doesn't want to give him any so he has uh, this long affair like a week long affair with this one Tony lady but then this is the interesting thing about Tony she's a PR woman who works for John Jr. John Jr. set the whole thing up he set it up to where she was getting like assaulted in like the street she set it up to where she'll meet Joe. She set he set it up to where she would drug Joe in his drink and sleep with him. So she basically date rapes him and everything. And it's just like there are no good characters on this show. <laughs> and so like when he when Joe discovers that Tony knows John Jr. set the whole thing up, he is pissed and he ends things with her. And she tells him, like, look, I really do like you and everything. And at first I didn't, but then I started to. And he's like, I don't care. I don't want nothing to do with you no more. But don't tell John Jr. because he's going to set John Jr. up. He kind of does, but not really. He doesn't. He just still goes with the flow because John Jr. is still helping him out. But John Jr. has no idea that Joe now knows. And so Joe is still dating Ariana. But then he decides he's going to break things up with her because he doesn't feel great that he cheated on her. And now since he's finally getting himself some, he doesn't want to go back to the woman that won't get him some. But, 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 Ariana drops her guard, her religious guard. <laughs> because when Joe started like getting upset and drinking that he found out that he was abandoned and then adopted, Ariana decides, well, you know what? We're so close and you're a great guy. I'm finally going to give you some. So she finally gives him stuff that one time. So you think he would stay with her because she's now finally giving him some. But he doesn't because he now likes this lifestyle of being fast, furious, drinking and messing around with women. And so he breaks up with her and it breaks her heart. This is perfect for John Jr. because he now starts to build a friendship with Ariana because he's going to use her. And he's gonna use her to piss off like Joe and stuff. So him and John Jr. are still trying to find out like what happened to his mom. They go to where the house that his mom lived in for a long time and it turns out that his father's company owns that house. So he's pissed at Bray talking about how come you lied to me, this and that. And she's all like, look, I didn't lie to you. I just didn't know. But you know, what's his face is on like the housing company and stuff like that. So they go there, they talk to the neighbor, the neighbor's all like, oh yeah, she was a nice lady, but she's dead now. And so now they think that John, Joe's mom is dead. And so, like, well, that's that. <laughs> now, as for the three kids, they decide that, you know what, the money's nice, but they want the company. So they're going to keep their shares and keep their holding in the company. This pisses Brady off, so now she's stuck with them. Joe doesn't want nothing to do with the company. Zach doesn't know what he's doing, but Savannah, Savannah wants to move up the ladder, the corporate ladder. And she wants Brady to help her. So Brady agrees 
So she's going to teach her everything she knows because she kind of suckered Brady in by saying like, you know, because the thing about Brady is that she didn't come from money. She started off as a hairdresser who later found a rich man. And then, you know, she took over the company and stuff. And so she tells Savannah, you know, you need some new clothes, some business clothes. We're going to have our first meeting and this and that. But Brady don't want nothing to do with her. One reason is because, remember Carl, the stepfather, the, the stripper owner dude? Well, he decides he's going to hop into Brady's car and put a knife to her throat. And he tells her to drive. They drive to like this um, junkyard he pipe place. And he's basically trying to shake down money from her. But Brady being a smart lady that she is, she has her cell phone on the entire time talking to a man named Fisher. And they're recording the entire conversation. So, Carl has no leverage now. Because, and, they just, and she just leaves him there at the junkyard. Now, Fisher. Fisher is just a man who works for Brady at the company. Um, he's under her, like, business-wise. And they're really good friends. There's nothing much we know about him until towards the end of the series. Let's put a pin in him for later. This man is interesting. So, you know, while she's there, so while Savannah's there at the um, company meeting and stuff with other shareholders, she made some pretty good, like, you know, suggestions, some other things she doesn't know. Like, she's very inexperienced. But the thing about her is she's a quick learner. Like, she really wants to better herself. And the shareholders, they're all like, you know, well, even though you don't know really what you're talking about, you do have some great ideas. And so they, for the most part, like her and stuff. They stuck Zach in pretty much mail duty. He just stuffs envelopes and puts stamps on them. <laughs> and that's when he starts to bond with Cherry. Now, remember when I said that Brady does not like Savannah and she knew who she was and her mom tried to shake her down for money. And now the stepfather tried to shake her down for money. She wants, she now knows she has something over the stepfather. But now she wants the stepmom completely out of the picture. Why? Because she doesn't want the stepmother to tell Savannah that, you know, that she knew who she was to begin with and that she didn't help her mom out. Plus now Brady is starting to kind of like Savannah and also Zach. So... Brady decides, I'm just going to take this woman out. And when I mean take out, I mean take out. See, she stole Nancy's prescribed medication. And she went over to Savannah's mom's house. Or apartment, I should say. And so, she goes there and they talk a while. But, you know, Savannah's mom hates Brady to death. And so she's like, all right, whatever. And Brady leaves. But Brady leaves her purse behind. And since it's an expensive purse, and you know, since Savannah's mom is the way she is, she looks through the purse looking for money, but she finds prescribed medication. Because she's a druggie who's been clean for a couple of years, she decides to relapse. When Savannah finds her, she is OD'd on the couch and has to be rushed to the hospital. And so, you know, her mom's all upset. She's like, I'm sorry I relapsed. And Savannah's, um, is really, really upset. Now, the thing about Carl, he's, have tr he's treated their family really nice. But he does help supply Savannah's mom with drugs. And so, Savannah, so for the most part, he's really nice. He's never sexually touched Savannah. But he is the type of man... That when he feels a woman is getting out of place, he will smack them around. He smacks Savannah's mom. He even smacks and threatens Savannah. When Zach tries to intervene, he beats up Zach twice in this series. Zach is a huge man, but he just gets his butt kicked by a lot of people. Savannah knows that, like, she does not want her mom to stay with Carl whatsoever no more. So she puts her mom in rehab. But then Carl is like looking for her and he finds her and he gets her out of rehab. Savannah is upset. He starts smacking Savannah around. Savannah decides, you know what? I'm not taking this crap no more. I got the money and I will soon have the power. So this is the plot armor I've been talking about where things just randomly happens. Carl sees Roxy talks to Savannah about something and then he wants to know, hey, what are y'all talking about? Well, she has no choice. He pays her money and she rats him out. So 
so he's all so he's all like oh I'm, uh, she thinks she's gonna get me killed oh i'm gonna turn the tables around so savannah and zach savannah tells zach what she did and he's all like you can't go through with this but i'm gonna go with you so they go there the abandoned place the junkyard place that they always hang out at um where carl always wants people to meet him at and so savannah's all like you know i'm just gonna call off the hit and all this other stuff well the cars show up so she's like crap well it's showtime car oh what's the name snake and carl open up the car doors they drag zach out and then carl gets in snake snake he holds zach up at gunpoint and savannah and carl in the car talking he's all like i heard what you tried to do you really think my friend's gonna like betray me like that and kill me and stuff and so you know he tells her pretty much i own you now plain and simple everything i want you're gonna give it to me money wise and stuff so she knows she is screwed so one day carl and savannah are talking at the club and he's telling her like i told you before about what happened with the first step that and how it wasn't him that killed him it was her mom then he starts talking crap about savannah's mom and stuff savannah's not having it she just happens to have a knife in her hand why i forget and so he's just berating her left and right and he's he like tries to like hurt her and stuff she stabs him in the stomach with the knife he dies she's like crap what did i do i just killed the man and there's blood all over the room in the strip club so she freaks out she calls zach zach is all like look man i'm not gonna let you go down like this i'm gonna help you so they're all like well what do we do he's all like well first things first we need to move the body then we need to clean this place up so they steal a van and then when they come back to move the, the body in the van carl's body is gone and they're all like the dude's dead he's not a zombie he just can't get up and walk away she's like well somebody must have got the body he's like well who so they don't know so they're freaking out but they decide to clean up that room get all the blood out and stuff so john jr he still is messing around with like the family and one thing he does is that he sets up savannah to go on this talk show this is before she like murdered carl so he sets up to go on this talk show type thing where you know because brady made her lie about her background nobody knows she's a stripper so then he gives her footage of her at the strip club so the, the announcer the, the, the host is all like so you're not a stripper well, what's this video footage about she's shocked she don't know what to say then an anonymous person in a silhouette comes out and talking about how he paid her for like sex and everything of course it's john jr he's having a great time watching this savannah's like oh my god of course the shareholders they don't like this this is bad company image and all this other stuff so what do they do they vote savannah out now during all this time john jr is still working his magic on joe and so is joe's mom and so is sir duncan so joe is becoming more and more and more corrupt well so savannah is like freaking out because you know there's a dead body somewhere and she don't know who stole it well guess who stole it it was her mom and roxy they totally did that to one get the money that um carl stole from savannah from the whole hit and now she's happy that carl is out the picture but she doesn't want savannah to go to jail and neither does she so she sets up brady she calls the police with a fake voice and the police are searching her house they find a murder weapon underneath brady's like bed and brady has no idea how it got there and so she gets taken away in handcuffs and the paparazzi's all around because the press got called and it's just like terrible you know what i'm saying brady feels so ashamed however even though she's ashamed she's still fierce man when she takes that mug shot look at her man like just look at it <laughs> so now savannah is upset because brady is now being charged for murder for something she did and she just can't deal with it you know what i'm saying so she's constantly contemplating about what she's going to do so she tells zach that she's just going to confess you know what i'm saying 
and stuff. But before she confesses, she's trying to figure out like how all this stuff like um came to be. Like how did they find a the knife in her room? Well, she figures out since you know um what's her name? Roxy was at um Brady's place. It must have been Roxy who did it. So she confronts her mom about it and her mom confesses to it. This pisses off Savannah even more and she tells her mom, you know what, I hate you and everything. Brady has been more of a mom to me than you ever have. And you know, I knew what happened between my stepfather. You knew what he was doing to me and you didn't do anything to stop him and stuff like that. And then, you know, and just like all kinds of stuff. So it breaks her mom's heart. So yeah, back to the argument that um Zach and Savannah was having. So she's all like, you know what, I'm gonna confess and all this other stuff. And you know, I just I just I just can't let Brady go to jail for something like this. And he's all like, You can't do this. And then he comes and then he kisses her. She is freaked out. She's all like, You're my brother, how can you do that? He confesses to her like really quickly that he's not her brother, but he loves her. But she don't want to listen. She just storms out, right? So she goes to the police station. She's about to confess. As soon as she's about to confess, the police officer gets a phone call. It turns out to be Savannah's mom. She is on a cliffside in a car with alcohol. And she tells the cop, like, I don't care what my daughter tells you. It was me who killed Carl. I'm the one who moved the body. I did this and I did that. And so you know exactly what's going to happen next. She cries on the phone and then she drives off the cliff. The cop has to tell Savannah what happened. She is heartbreaking, heartbroken about this. She has to identify the body and it causes her to spiral out of control. And when I mean she spirals out of control, she goes into a very dark place and she starts to mingle with snake and he's providing her tons of alcohol and drugs this is her first time ever doing drugs and she's just out of it and she's constantly sleeping with snake and it's like when they're doing it she looks like she's a zombie like she's out of it like she's not even there because she's not even enjoying herself she's just going through the motions you know both like Zach and Brady are trying to talk to her and trying to bring her back, but she doesn't want to. She's just, she hates her life now. And this is not her new life. She's now taking over the strip car on um, strip club bar place. Because see, when Carl died, they were gonna get rid of the strip club, but Snake forced Savannah's mom to stay with the club and he assaults um, Savannah's mom. And so then later on, Snake, he starts, like, then, um, what is it? Zach telling her, like, you know, you're coming home and all this other stuff. She's like, I'm not coming home. And then Snake sees that and he pretty much mangles Zach's hand. Like, he beats Zach up twice in this whole series. And it's just like, Zach cannot fight. So then, you know, Savannah is telling him, like, you know, don't hurt my brother and stuff like that. And he's all like, well, I, you don't care about him. And then he starts like assaulting like, you know, Savannah and stuff. Well, at this point in time, Brady now really cares for Savannah. At first she didn't, but now she does. And so she goes to Savannah's like apartment and she just starts throwing down some truth bombs and telling her how she's living her life, how her mom really was, how she doesn't need this lifestyle. And Savannah just bursts out in tears because she just can't take it no more. And, and Brady tells her, look, leave this place leave that strip club and come back home where you deserve back in my mansion and she agreed so after savannah cleans her life up and she leaves the club for one final time and she leaves snake snake is outside the um strip club and all of a sudden a hooded figure comes out and goes completely negan on him with a baseball bat and this is before negan did it in the tv show and so like he is just this person busting up um snake with a baseball bat and <laughs> this is something you won't see on american tv to add insult to injury 
he then pees on Snake's face and all in his mouth. I'm like, oh my God. You won't see that on American television. You only see it overseas. That is insult to injury. But Snake gets a good look at the dude because his one good eye pops open because the other eye is, you know, slammed shut. Now you think it's Zack because Snake uh, broke Snake's wrist and everything and beat him up on uh, him at gunpoint. But then you're like, oh wait, his wrist is messed up, so it can't be Zack. The person takes off the hood and it's Fisher, Brady's like business associate. And it's just like, okay, I get why he did that. He hit on Savannah. Um, you know, he's married and he knows Brady wants Snake taken care of and wants him away from um, Savannah. Well, Snake survives this and he wants to know who this, where this man is and stuff like that. And he thinks Savannah has something to do with it. She tells him like she had no idea, you know what I'm saying? Now, because Brady was charged with murder at first or um, suspected of murder, all of her enemies that work for the company are now pouncing on this matter. Sir Duncan, John Jr.'s mom, you name it. They convince Joe to not only, they convince him to get on the board of trustees, which Brady does not want him on there, but she agrees. Then they vote to permanently kick out Savannah. But then Brady wants to be reinstated. They vote no on that. And Joe is one of the ones who votes no. And this is the point that disappoints me about. He has no ill will towards Brady, but he's kicking her out the company. And he's partnering himself with people who don't even like him because of his skin tone, but he's hanging out with these people. And it's like Brady has done nothing to this dude. And he just like stabs her like in the front you know, or the back or whatever, you know? And it just doesn't make no sense. This is why he disappoints me out of everybody in the show. It's just like, what has happened to this man who was very humble? And every time he portrays Brady and, and sticks it to her, he has his hair down or his hand over his mouth. And he only briefly looks at her with like his eyes and stuff. Now, when it comes to Joe, he starts to discover from Sir Duncan that there's a man named Maxwell Lloyd. And he wants to take over joe's father's company and they want him to too so they tell him to get in good with the man so in order to get in good with him they had to get in good with his daughter so nancy and joe go to this place where they find maxwell's daughter named annabelle annabelle is this tall gorgeous woman who is freaky all she does is sleep around there's like a the little auction thing where you kind of like, you know, you bid on a person to go on a date with them. He wins. As soon as they she wins, she sleeps with him in the auction place. They're constantly doing it. He doesn't want Ariana no more. Now he's all into Annabelle. And they're just like constantly doing it. Well, Annabelle sees them come out like this room and his hair is a little ruffled. She's pissed. She punches him in the stomach. <laughs> <laughs> Ariana's tough, man. Because Joe like taught her how to box a long time ago. Annabelle thinks this is all funny and this and that. Now John Jr. is getting back in the mix. And he's letting um, Ariana know that Joe is constantly sleeping around with Annabelle. He does not tell her about Tony. He introduces her to Tony. But... Ariana has no idea it was Tony that was messing around with Joe in the beginning that broke them up. And so, cause John is still trying to get in his good graces with Ariana. He's trying to get her to set up these like housing projects for like um, poor kids and kids of color. So they can have a place to live and stuff in their family. Anyways, this causes problems between Joe, John Jr. and Ariana and even Annabelle. See, Joe does not want Ariana hanging out with John Jr. because he knows he's a terrible person. And he keeps trying to tell Anna, um, Ariana this. She's all like, oh, you're just saying that because you're pissed or jealous or blah, 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 stuff like that. And because, you know, John is slowly putting his meat hooks into Ariana. 
And so this is also causing a problem for Ariana because she now starts to turn dark. It was in the paper that those two are now a power couple, Joe and Annabelle. She's so pissed that once once Joe moved out of John Jr.'s place, he got his own place. Ariana in the middle of the night takes a brick and busts through his window. He has no idea who it is. Um, Annabelle doesn't seem phased by that. But then she starts to confront um, Annabelle about I mean Ariana. Annabelle confronts Ariana. We find out that Annabelle is nuts in the head. When she confronts Ariana, she beats her up. Like, seriously. It's like the woman is crazy. Then to add more fuel to the fire, John Jr. breaks into, like, Joe's home and sets it on fire. Yeah. And he, of course, he and when he sets it on fire, he has Ariana's. I don't know. Well, he doesn't have Ariana's underwear. He just has random women's underwear. And so when Joe and Annabelle go to investigate, um, Annabelle finds, like, you know, the underwear and she assumes it's Ariana. Joe's like, oh, no, she'll never do nothing like this. But she's like, oh, yeah, well, she put a brick through your window and stuff. Well, all of this mess starts to cause Ariana and Joe to start dating. She starts kissing him and stuff, but he's pulling away. He doesn't want her like that. But then she convinces him a little bit more, and then now all of a sudden she starts sleeping around. The religious lady who doesn't sleep around is now all of a sudden sleeping around. And she's doing it with a man who she knows is not good. But that's what makes her stupid. Joe finds out he's furious. He's furious. And he tries to warn her about Joe. I mean, John. That he's a terrible person, that he does this and he does that. And to the point where Joe and John Jr. start fist fighting and stuff. Then Ariana starts to get a little bit more, like, stalkery ex-girlfriend-ish. When the repairman was at John's place, repair, uh, Joe, Joe's place repairing the window, somehow she sneaks in. And the repairman just thinks she lives there. She finds, conveniently, Annabelle's, like, business card with her cell phone number on it. Because, you know, plot armor. And then she texts Annabelle telling her, you don't know who Joe is, and he'll just use you and stuff like that. But Annabelle doesn't seem phased. So Annabelle introduces Joe to her father, Maxwell Lloyd. Those two hit off instantly. Here's the thing about Maxwell. He is old school 1950s. Not racist, but he doesn't treat women very well. Women are beneath him. He does not treat his daughter very well at all. He will not give her the company business. When he meets Joe and finds out that him and his daughter are dating and sticking it to each other, he tells Joe straight up, I want you to get my daughter pregnant because I want a grandchild. I want somebody to take over my family business. He hopes that it will be a male, but he'll sell for whatever. But he just doesn't want his daughter to have it because she's too out there and flirtatious and stuff. She doesn't really care about corporate stuff. And Joe's kind of just like, what in the world? Like, he's literally being told to make a baby with somebody, you know? Now, Annabelle being a jealous person that she is, she calls up Ariana and she threatens her on the phone. When Ariana tells Joe this, he doesn't believe her at all. Then all of a sudden, Tony shows back up and she talks to Joe. She tells him she's pregnant. And he's like, oh, crap. <laughs> and she tells him, don't worry, I'm going to handle this baby. And so he tells Annabelle that Annabelle's not happy, but she's like, all right, she's going to take care of it. Now, we know what, what that means, take care of abortion. So Annabelle's happy. Joe is not. Joe's all like, he doesn't want to abandon his son like his dad did him. So he finds um, Tony. He tells her, look. No matter what, like, I want to be with you. I want to be with this baby life. I will leave Annabelle and stuff like that. And she's all like, you're only saying that because you got me pregnant. And, you know, he confesses, yeah, but it's just like, you know, they had a thing together, so why not? Annabelle finds out she is not happy whatsoever. Then she finds Tony and she confronts her. And she threatens the crap out of Tony so much that... She sets it up for Tony to leave New Zealand, move to America in New York, and abort the baby. Tony calls up Joe on the phone, tells her, hey, look, it's not going to work. I don't like you. I don't want to be with you. I'm going to get rid of this baby, blah, blah, blah. Bye. 
he's heartbroken and runs to a grieving um he runs to grieve in um annabelle and it's just like this is the last we see of tony in this season and it's just like you know it's just like dude, that's it she's just like gone now you know oh yeah so like ariana and john jr get like engaged and yeah so they're gonna get married joe's not happy whatsoever and annabelle's not happy that joe is pissed off about this so since now john jr is now with ariana john jr's mom is not happy that's when she uses that huge racial slur and all this other stuff so anyways turns out that since john jr's mom's not happy she freezes him out of all his money he is now broke and he's pissed so him and ariana they hacked his mom email and they find out something really interesting turns out she owns a resort in hawaii and it turns out there's a woman staying there that woman has joe's mother's name joe's mother is alive and she was put over there in hawaii by john jr's um mom and john jr mom literally tells joe your mom is dead and blah 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 but she lied to him so john jr confronts her about that and he tells her he wants his money back he wants to be the gm of the housing company again because his mom took all that from him yeah J joe doesn't know this yet he'll find out next season so like now doing another business meeting it turns out that um sir duncan joe john's um juniors joe jr's um, mother and maxwell lloyd they have bought out all the shareholders at brady's company and they are new to, they're the, now the new shareholders and they no longer want brady there they fire her and they hire fisher to be the new ceo brady is pissed because she's like fisher how can you do this to me and blah, blah 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 and how can you do this to john he was like a father to you then we find out some interesting thing about fisher finally it turns out that fisher's dad and john senior were friends and then a mysterious fire happened that killed fisher's dad and so so he's been playing all this from like the beginning but nobody never knew this just came out like a twist out of like nowhere so with kennedy i haven't talked about what kennedy's been up to lately okay so kennedy so like i said before she got rescued by alan and everything and because grace will leave her at the club to be with older men so you know they're grooming he's grooming her and then she t starts to tell grace that she's dating this guy grace starts to be like well who is it just tell me she's like no i can't tell you because he's promising not to tell nobody grace assumes that it is somebody from school it's not she steals candy's cell phone and she calls up alan he is pissed at candy for this and say you betrayed my trust i told you don't tell nobody we're never seeing each other again now this whole time he's never touched um candy at all so then candy and grace they fight about this and then you know um they stop being friends but then they start being friends again soon they start being friends again grace just kisses candy and candy's like what the heck are you doing and she's like i thought you were straight she's like no i just mess around with men just for fun but you know i like girls and stuff and so then <laughs> yeah so then and then so then Kennedy's all like, you know, she wants to get Alan back because he's a creep. And he might do this to other young girl. The real reason is because he rejected her and that broke her heart. But then she does come to the revelation he might do this to other women. So they start to devise a plan to like capture him and, uh, uh, and expose him. So they have Grace go undercover and pretend to be like a young girl thinking he might try something with her. He doesn't and end up calling the police. This pisses off Ken uh, Grace's dad who's banging Brady at this time and um so they're like crap then this is where things get a little interesting grace starts becoming like a predatory lesbian when she constantly keeps trying to kiss on um kennedy and kennedy keeps pushing her back it's like you know my life but then kennedy's all like just take it slow i'm just like take it slow so that means she is into grace and i'm just like how like she's been shown to like dudes this entire time so this came out of nowhere but i guess it's their best friends and she figured like hey you know i got my heart broken maybe she does like girls something i don't know so at some point in time, um, they're still trying to like, you know, expose the Allen dude, right? 
So they set up where Candy goes over there. Things backfire because Alan takes Candy to like a, lo a location far, far away at this like um, place that he owns. Grace is upset because she hasn't heard from Candy and she sees the drives off with him. So she tells Brady and her dad. They are pissed. Now Candy is smart enough to call um, Grace's cell phone and hide it behind her back and record the entire conversation. And so his thing between Candy and Alan, he's never touched her, but being a stupid teenager, she sent him new pictures. Well, briefly new pictures. She covers up her boobs and stuff. So he tells her like, you know, since they're far, far away, hey, you know, it's time for you to fully show me naked and stuff. So she freaks out. She goes, she makes an excuse to go to the bathroom. She busts out of there and she um, then more plot armor happens to where what is it? Um, Candy's mom, Brady, and Grace's dad. They show up at that dude's place out of like within record time. Like it just conveniently happens because they track the cell phone and stuff. And you know, Grace's dad punches him, and Brady tells him, "Don't you ever touch my daughter again," and all this other stuff. So then, Candy and Brady they have like a conversation, and you know about what happened. And, Candy tells her you know, how she's sorry, but now they have proof, um, recorded proof that this man is creepy and stuff. And she tells her mom, you know, do whatever it takes, but you know, make sure, like, you know, you need to go to the cops and turn this dude in. Her mom cries and says she will. Hmm. Well, at some point in time, Brady and Grace's dad, they have a huge fight. Not because of what happened with the girls, but because he thinks that Brady leaked some information out to the press because he works for the government. So they break up. Brady is at her office because she hasn't been fully kicked out yet. And so she calls up Alan and tells him that she wants to meet with him in her office. Cherry overhears this and thinking, why is she talking to Alan? He's such a creep and everything. And so she takes Brady's cell phone, looks through it and see that she called Alan and she, and, and you know, Cherry tells her, how can you do this after what he did to your daughter? And I quit. So, being Brady, she needs to seal the deal and everything. She tells him, look, you can have my daughter's cell phone. I probably not to leak this out to nobody, but I want you to sign these documents, giving me like all the stuff that I want. And he agrees because he's pissed scared. And he tells her, strangely, he never touches. He is the type who likes to look, but he won't touch and stuff. Now, of course, being Brady, she lies to him and she, um, has a PI person either look for information on his laptop or plants information. He gets arrested and it turns out, okay, she did have her daughter's back, but she wanted a little incentive also. Cherry is upset, but she gets rehired. And so one time when Candy and Grace were in their room, Brady uh, walks, barges in without knocking on the door and she sees Candy and Grace getting it on underneath the covers. And Grace pretty much tell well, Grace is now fully into this relationship now. Cause now she starts kissing on Grace a lot of times now, and they just like dating, which just came out of nowhere. I don't care that it happened, but it would have been having some build up. Like, cause we saw the build up between how she liked it, Zach and everything, but there was no build up to her liking Candy. I mean, her liking Grace and Grace liking Candy. But you know what? She tells her mom that I'm in love with Grace and there ain't nothing you're gonna do about it. Her mom's like, well, I don't care. You know, just do what you want. And it's just kind of like she's in love with her now. When Grace kept kissing her, she kept pushing her off her. So that just doesn't make no sense. So at some point in time, we actually do get to see that Brady does actually care about John Sr. Uh, one time she was looking at his picture and she talking about how could he leave her with all this mess. I'm just like, lady, you cheated on him with all these men. You ain't exactly innocent. You know what I'm saying? But at least she did care about him. And not just the money. But that doll is still freaking her out. So she goes and finds Maria. And Maria's working like on the floors because she can't get like no really good cleaning job now. Because she doesn't have a good resume because of what Brady said about her. So she tells Maria, I need to know everything you know about my husband and blah, 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 stuff like that. And she tells her, fine, I'll tell you, but you have to pray with me first. So they pray. And as they're praying, <laughs> Maria is insulting Brady left and right, calling her like an adulterer and stuff like that. It's just hilarious. 
And so, like, she tells her, like, some stuff in her own cryptic kind of way that doesn't really help Brady out. There. But in the confession, as Brady was praying, she confessed, like I said before, she did love John Sr. and stuff. Frustrated now that she has lost her company and Fisher has betrayed her and stuff, she's starting to wonder, like, what is the deal with this doll and why is half his body burnt? Well, she finds out from Nancy, no, she found out from Fisher that his dad died in the fire. But she starts to wonder because of plot armor, you know, convenience just happened. Something's going on. So she rips the doll, like, head off and rips the arms off and she's looking inside to see if she can find anything. Why? Like, I don't know. Plot armor, you know what I'm saying? So she can't find nothing in that. But then she has a flashback of everything that was in the box that when she was cleaning out his office. And one of those things was a picture. So she decides to look at the back of the picture. And there she finds a flash drive. How did she suspect something might be in there? Plot armor, you know what I'm saying? And on there is audio. John, oh no, wait, we do hear John Sr. speak. Speak. I forget because his voice is on the audio. He recorded a conversation he had with Fisher. I forgot we hear from John Sr. But it's an audio only for some reason. And he's talking about like, you know, something about Fisher, something, something, and his daughter or some crap like that. And it's kind of like his daughter, he must be talking about Savannah. And so, you know, Garth and Savannah, they're talking, oh, Zach and Savannah, they're talking. He tells her like how, you know, First, she's all like, you know, we didn't grow up together, so it was okay you kissed me and stuff, and I can understand. But then he tells her straight up, you know, he's not her real brother, and he tells her what happened. And so, they have a conversation, and she tells him about Fisher, because Fisher keeps hitting on her, and he's married. And he's like, oh, I'll kill that guy. And then he tells her what happened. She tells him what happened with her and John Jr. Oh, I'll kill that guy. Now, this is the dude who got beat up by two men who are a lot smaller than him, so I don't really see that happening. But in a way, she confesses to... Zach about how she knows um Fisher because see what happened was when Fisher took over the company Cherry saw him and Savannah talking and she overheard something really interesting then she saw Fisher on the phone he said he's gonna leave town she checks Fisher's cell phone and it turns out he called Savannah so being Cherry she confronts um Zach about this but he doesn't really believe her and, but then he starts to start to suspect some stuff, you know? So Zach, you know, he asks her straight up, how do you know Fisher and everything? And she confesses something that just blew my mind. Savannah knew this whole time she was John Sr.'s daughter from the very start of the season, like from the first episode. But she pretended like she did not know. Um, And so, like, you know... So what happened was in a flashback, she went to John Sr. to like try to meet him, but he didn't want nothing to do with her. So he shunned her away and had security take her away. Soon as she's in the elevator, she meets Fisher and then they start talking. And Fisher tells her plain and simple, you know, he's going to get John Sr. to change his will to include um, Savannah and also, you know, make sure that he gets part of the company because of what happened to his dad burning in that fire. And so... Zach is pissed. He's pissed at Savannah for this. Because he's all like, you knew this whole time and you just completely lied and you deceived everybody. Yet she was not mad at him for deceiving her, but he's pissed now at her. So he has a lot of gall to be pissed at somebody. Then Brady wants to talk to Savannah about something, about the audio that she heard. And Zach is in the room with her. He's still pissed off. And so Savannah's like, crap. So she has to confess to Brady that she knew the whole time and like the stuff I just told you about before. Brady is pissed. And like, um, she tells Savannah, get out of this house. You are no longer welcome here. So now that Zach hates her and like Brady hates her, Savannah goes back to sleep at the club because she doesn't have that apartment, her mom's apartment no more, and she's drinking. She decides, you know what, I'm just gonna like, you know, um, watch my column. I'm just gonna like end all this crap now. Because she's starting to suspect something when it comes to fishing. 
So she goes to Snake. She tells Snake, look, this is where Fish is going to be at um, this afternoon. So show up there. So she goes and she meets with Fisher. They're talking about this and that. And then as they're talking, he confesses something to her. He confesses that he did everything for her and tried to get her her money and the wheel changing this and that. And then he confesses to her, he murdered John Sr. They had that um, argument that John Sr. recorded. And then he tossed John Sr. off the roof of the building. And it's kind of like, so he was murdered. That's something they did not bring up throughout the entire series. And you know, people just really didn't suspect it. They just thought it was suicide. So then Savannah and him are talking, but she keeps looking back at the door. And he's all like, why do you keep looking back at the door for? Of course, plot summary. Because she's waiting for the gangsters to show up and kill Fisher, um, snake gangs and stuff. And so he's just like, did the most shocking thing ever. I did not see this coming. If it was an American show, it would have been over choreographed and there would have been a whole lot more craziness going on in between. He picks Savannah up. She is struggling. He goes straight to the window. Cause you see how high up they are. They all are they're all on like skyscrapers, tall buildings. And then he just throws her over the building. There's no hesitation. There's no her trying to plead for her life. He just picks her up, take her by the window, and toss her over the ledge and everything. And I'm just like, oh my God, you could feel the tension with that because it wasn't dragged out. It wasn't over choreographed, nothing. And there she lays on the ground. And you remember, they are high up. They are high up. So you have to think, how did she survive that? And I remember thinking to myself, oh my God, please don't kill this character off. I like this character way too much. You know what I'm saying? But thank God, because I was watching it on streaming, I was able to see what happened after that. And I could not believe what happened after that. And it's just, and you will find out too, <laughs> when I talk about season two later on and stuff. But yeah, this series has some slight flaws in it you know what i'm saying but it's very engaging i love like the music i love the edginess to it i love like the, the stuff that's written for these characters it's so much better than the american one and it's a really good series i guess like, they should have put this on like on the cw next to dynasty and just had like a whole lot of craziness happen i mean it was on fox so you assume some craziness would happen but you know it didn't but yeah, it's like, this is a really, really, really good show. And I remember I talked to um, the actress who plays Brady. And I told her how, like, oh, you know, it sucks the show got canceled. The American one got canceled. And she was disappointed because she wanted to see how Kim Cattrall was going to portray her character and stuff. Not very good. I watched that first. I, all I watched was the first episode. I'm not watching nothing else. <laughs> but yeah. Alrighty, well, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.